I have 60 slides in 40 minutes, so let's go fast. Um, yeah, you, they're all online. You can download them. Um, some of them are a little bit duplicates. Um, please ask questions. Um, that's what makes this interesting for me. Heckle, make fun of me. Um, it's good. So I'm going to go over the kernel security process. In the first part, how we do kernel security, a reactive kernel security, and how the second part is all about CVEs. A lot of you have noticed since February, kernel, we're responsible for CVEs. There's been a lot of them. What just happened? Why? Let's talk about this. First, my disclaimer. This is just me saying this. Um, I've been doing this for a long time, so maybe other people might agree. Um, here's the latest kernel, 6.10, uh, 85,000 files, 38 million lines. Um, that's the whole tree. We support everything, all architectures, all devices, all drivers, for everything. <clears throat> you don't use this. You only use maybe this. My laptop uses about one and a half, two million lines of code. I think a little bit bigger with the AMD drivers. Um, your server, no, your server uses one and a half. Laptop uses about two million lines of code. Your phone uses about four million lines of code. Your phone SOC is the most complex beast there is. That uses the largest amount of kernel. Um, that being said, like a Pixel phone uses the core kernel and then 300 out of tree drivers. So the, all that eight million lines of, or 35, 38 million lines doesn't include those drivers. Anyway, that's what you use. So out of everything, you're, not, you're only using a small portion, but everybody uses a different portion, and that's the important thing to remember. And here, our speed, um, we're still doing this. Past four or five years, we're still going about nine changes an hour to the tree, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we go up, up to 10, a little bit, 8.5, it's nine, we're like plateau, which is hugely fast. We thought we were going too fast at two and a half changes an hour. Um, that's crazy. Um, our new release model since 2004, some people don't realize this. Every release is stable. New release every two to three months. Always upgrade. And you always should upgrade because we will not break user space. We guaranteed this back in 2007. Um, it's a long time ago. Um, we will not break user space. That's a one rule of kernel development. We won't break user space on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> we are human. We mess, make up. We make mistakes. We fix it, we roll it back. That's the only time you'll see Linus or me or anybody get yelled at or yell at anybody is when you purposely break user space. Sometimes we have to because of security issues and there's other things that happen and we'll work with people and whatnot, but on purpose. Oh, we can break user space if nobody notices. We do that a lot to clean up old interfaces that things aren't being used anymore or stuff just wasn't working before. Clean it up and see if anybody screams. If they do, we'll fix it back up. We do that a lot. Anyway. Always should be able to upgrade a kernel. Never should be afraid of this. It should always just work. As proof, um, people have done this. Pixel 6 phone has been updated to every single RC release for the past three years, and it just worked with 300 out of tree drivers. Android can do this, 300 out of tree drivers. You should be able to do it for your laptop. You should easily be able to do it for your server. There's no reason why not, as long as you test. Just test. Um, version numbers, everybody should know. They mean nothing, it's just an incremental. This number is bigger than that number. When it gets too big, we'll roll over into another one. Um, 6. Dot, we'll go 7.0 in probably another two years, maybe another year. When the numbers get too big, that's all it means. There's not versioning, there's not semantic versioning. Just this number came after that number. That's it. Here's our current release cycle. Um, we do a big one. 6.10 happened. A couple weeks ago, then we do our, um, everybody merges stuff to Linus for two weeks. We get a release candidate one, release candidate two after that, three, four, five. Bug fixes only, regression fixes every week until 6.11 comes out, and then we start the cycle over again. The stable kernels, you guys have seen this slide before. I fork off from that and start doing releases. The changes have to be on Linus's tree in order to go into the stable trees. We do this after it gets done, we throw it away and we keep on going new ones. Do about one or two of these a week, stable kernels. Um, they work out pretty well. Right now, developers are at RC4, and you guys are at 6FN RC6. Um, this laptop is running RC3. Sorry, I'm a week behind. Um, yeah, that's how things work. Really good, really well. Uh, rules about what goes into the Linux's tree. Bug fix should be less than 100 lines. New ideas of quirks. Uh, there's the process. Um, these are rules to say no to. It's a gray area. We added some new syscalls 
last week for an architecture because it was a security and one could say it was a regression. Um, as a stable kernel update, somebody, people ask that. We do take performance increases. Uh, we, take hu we took a huge backwards, backport for NFS the other day because it was fixing a lot of security issues. Uh, it was about 300, 400 patches. Um, we do do some bigger things, but in general, always work with the community. It's up to the maintainer. It works out really well. That being said about stable kernels, we have a long-term kernel. We're maintaining at least two years. We're running about six years for these kernels. Um, right now, those are the active ones. Um, next one, we pick one kernel a year. It's the last kernel of the year. It's a date-based thing. Uh, makes it easy for people to plan. That's how things work. Um, Long-term kernels, this, I just ran the numbers last night. Um, that's what we're running about every day. Um, so this is a proportion, a much smaller proportion of what goes into Linus's tree. Um, is that 10%? Somebody did the math once. Um, only a small portion of what goes in Linus's tree goes into the stable trees. That works out well. Um, it's good. And over time, things get slower because it's harder to backport stuff. It takes more energy and more effort and more expertise to backport to older kernels than it does newer kernels. So never put a junior engineer on an older kernel. Put it on the latest one. This is hard to maintain. So when people say they try to maintain kernels for longer than six years, six years is hard. I have a very difficult time with this. Sasha has a very difficult time with this. Um, that's real work. Um, don't do that. <laughs> people like doing these sometimes. I don't recommend it. But anyway, it works well for people. So again, kernel releases, remember this. Think about this when I talk about security in a minute. Um, 17, yeah, 17 years old. Um, here's how the kernel's released. Here's the model. There's a link. I described it out. It was based on a white paper that was written for Android to talk about this because Android takes all the stable kernel updates they have for many years now. This was a white paper written for them to get them to change their mind. They did. Made it public. It works out pretty well. So let's talk about other things now. People don't realize this. I had a conversation a few minutes ago about Debian. <clears throat> At least 70% of the world servers run Debian. I say at least. That's the number the cloud providers are able to give me that I could say out loud. I think it's more. 80%, over 80% of the world's servers do not run company-based servers. Red Hat, SUSE, Ubuntu are great distros and whatnot, but quantity-wise, they are small potatoes compared to the huge amount of the world. The biggest user is Android, and this even bigger user is your 3G or 5G or 4G or 3G modem. All Apple devices have Linux running on their modem. It's kind of funny. Qualcomm, all Qualcomm chips run Linux inside them. Um, because of this, most of the community-based stuff the old uh, model of companies talking to companies and doing NDAs to talk about security, and when that does not work because they're not the ones actually with the largest number of servers out there. They're not the ones doing the work. The community does the work, and community cannot sign an NDA. Um, oh, and embedded, yeah, Yocto. Yocto runs the world too as well. So think about that. When people focus on these enterprise distros and these companies, that's not what's really happening. That's a huge business. But the majority of the systems in the world are not them. So talk about the kernel security. We have a kernel security team. We've had them for about 20 years now. Um, this is reactive, not proactive. We react to problems that are given to us. We don't pro work providing pro things to fix things in the future. There are some pe cross people on both teams. But other groups do proactive security. And proactive security is doing really good stuff, hardening the kernel. Um, taking away whole classes of exploits, taking away whole classes of potential bugs in the kernel. The way we use C in the kernel is very different than the way we used to use C 20 years ago, very different than 30 years ago. We use a very safer version of C. We have bounds checking. We have implicit control. Much, much better. Um, those guys do really, really good work. That's proactive. We're reactive. Uh, we're a mailing list. We're an email alias, small group of kernel developers. We only represent ourselves. We do not represent any company. We cannot tell anybody. We cannot tell anybody what we know. We, our job is to fix bugs only. All we do, we triage reports. 
sent us a bug report. We, okay, yes, that really is a security issue. We grab the maintainer of that subsystem, bring them into the, to the bug report, it's an email thread, hash it out with the people, fix the bug, get it merged. Um, if you are drug into this mailing list multiple times over the years, you'll get added to the alias. So you really don't want to be part of the security alias. That implies your subsystem has problems. Um, there's some people on that team that are just maintainers of their subsystems because they're, they have had issues over the years. Our job is to get the fix as soon as possible and get it merged. That's a bit. That's all we do. Um, okay, yeah. Um, so it's not a good thing if you're asked. <laughs> it's not prestigious. Um, it's usually because we're tired of having to manually add you. Um, we don't do embargoes. We will do an embargo for seven days max if we have the fix. We will not, we'll not sell, say anything to anybody for long, long, long periods of time as long as we're working on the fix. Famously, we had one for um, 18 months, one network issue. Um, that took forever to fix, just back and forth with, with some researchers. There was no real rush on it, but it was working out really well, but there was no embargo. But once we had the fix, max seven days, we kind of, we did 14 days once for somebody, not a good idea. And we don't do any announcements. We merge the, merge the fix, and away we go. Don't let any, tell anybody, we don't do anything like that. And the fact that we don't do any announcements makes people nervous. And way back in 2008, when we first started this thing, um, you can read these emails. Um, somebody was worried about this. And the problem is there's lots and lots of bug fixes that are going to the kernel today that are security fixes done on public mailing lists. And if we were to call some out explicitly, that would make those other really valid fixes seem less than, right? Famously, networking for years refused to work with the security team. They only wanted to work in public, which is great. That's their decision. So any networking security bug was always public. So no, it would never be announcement that way. So they're just bugs. A bug is a bug is a bug, especially at our layer, fix them and move on. Especially at our layer, they're usually a security issue because at our layer, everything's a problem. And Linus has some other good quotes. People are wrong. Let you read that for a second. And then finally, in this thing thread, what was, about, what was unclear about that? Um, we have a way, how to report security bugs. The whole thread is there if you want to read it. Somehow I was on it, I'm always on the fun ones. And there's the original thread. So the kernel security policy is this. All bugs could be a security issue. It's that simple. When there's a bug in our area, if you're gonna crash the machine, security issue. If you're gonna destroy data, security issue. If you're gonna reboot the machine, security issue. <laughs> These are at our level of the stack. That's just what things are. Fix them, move on. Um, people say, oh, well, I don't want to take a fix because there could be a fix for the fix. A fix could be wrong, right? Well, no. Yes, that is true, but a fix for something that we know is a fix today is much better than the potential that it might not be a fix. It's, it's really awkward to say. Willie said this, kind of translated from French. Maybe that's why it looks a little odd. <laughs> um, but. Not, not disparaging French. <laughs> um, it sounded much more pretty in French, too. Um, we'll fix them then. Fix what we know now today. If it comes up and that bug is, that fix wasn't really real, we'll fix it again. Not an issue. Move on. So the biggest, biggest problem with this, because all bugs could be security issues, is we can't call it out because we don't know how you use Linux. Remember, Linux is in the Mars helicopter. It is an automatic cow milking machines. It's an air traffic control for Europe. It's in the printer in the Airbus planes. It's in all your cell phone towers. It's in your phone. It's in your servers. Um, it's in my air conditioning. It's in my washing machine, my dishwasher. Um, it is, we don't know how your use case is. And we don't know what code you use, right? It's only a portion of it, we, only little bits of it. So I don't know how you use this product or this software. I don't want to know how this stuff it works because then I would have to try and keep track of it all. That's not the way open source works. We're giving you a tool to solve a problem for what you're having. Great, use it to solve your problem, but I don't need to know how that works unless it doesn't work well, then tell me. So we don't want to know any of this stuff. And Ben Hawks said this really, really well. Very good security researcher. He's like, I found a bug. Let's try and exploit it. 
and read his blog, What's a Good Linux, secure, well, good Linux Bug? Um, he's like, this is great, it's a real bug, but he couldn't exploit it because it turned out it didn't really work in this environment and it didn't work in that environment, but it worked in this other environment. And it's like, it, this, we don't have a monocultural ecosystem, we have a bunch of different use cases, which is good. We're stronger that way, but also vulnerability remedi remediation is very, very hard because of that. So you can't just look at a bug and say, okay, great, this is a security issue, or no, it isn't a security issue, um, unless you bound your, what you're checking really well um, without knowing all this stuff. Ben says it really well. Cool, so what is our policy? Our policy is fix it as soon as possible, get release out as, to users as soon as possible, but this doesn't work for hardware bugs. Spectrum Meltdown, CPU vendors, are, I think they're special. Um, they're not, they're just slow. I routinely get bug reports from CPU vendors like, hey, we found this bug, we'll fix it in 18 months. I'm like, oh, don't tell me. I don't wanna know this. Um, the good thing, the EU has rules for the CRA that they're gonna have to fix things within two weeks. <laughs> they're not special. This is gonna be so fun to watch. Um, two weeks we can handle. Two months we can handle. Hardware vendors are not are having, gonna have a big wake up call. Um, hardware security issues are handled separately. We have a special mailing list. We have, don't do NDAs. We cross, we drag in vendors across companies. We're not allowed, they're there as an individual from uh, the community, not as your company. You can't test on infrastructure. You can't share the patches. Uh, we do emb tolerate embargoes. Uh, we work with researchers. We work with other operating systems, the BSDs, Windows, Apple. Um, we all work together, works out pretty well. Um, and, um, encrypted email lists are hard for some people. Famously, one big company insisted that we do it in encrypted email. Like, great, we set it up, and then they came back to us and said, oops, our email infrastructure can't do encrypted email. <laughs> We're like, fix your email. So we got it working. Now you need to do it. They finally did. Um, yeah, Gmail does not handle this very well at all. Um, I don't know how Google people do it. Um, and how this all works. Um, bar good hardware issues. We did just change the rules a little bit based on some feedback. The fun part is when we change these rules, we have to go talk to the lawyers. The lawyers have to go talk to other lawyers and all of them get together and say yes or no. And anyway, it works out pretty well. Um, that's hardware security issues. So the kernel security team, we don't do any announcements. We can, they cannot assign CVEs on purpose. Kernel security team does not do CVEs. And there's no early announcement lists. And everybody always wants to know, get me on the early announcement list. I want to pre-disclose this stuff, right? Pro software projects have this. Of course, why would you not want this stuff? Um, because of this. Any early notice list is a leak. Come on, think about it. Who is a user of Linux? Everybody's a user of Linux. Um, your government's a user of Linux. My government's a user of Linux. Um, all these companies are a user of Linux. Who is not going to want to be on that list? The only way this is not a leak is only if your project's not used by anybody. And the most important thing I want to drive people thing home, pre-disclosure does not work because what, if it did, why would your government allow it to? They wouldn't, right? If they thought that they were, that I was giving secrets away to somebody else for some other national government, they would not let me do that. It just doesn't work that way. So there's no pre-disclosure. And I have a feeling, oh, coming sooner, we're always the canary in the coal mine. Other projects that are actually being used by people will have, this, have to go through the same thing. No pre-disclosure, get the fixes out, everybody update. It's the only way it works. Security fixes, they all happen at least once a week. This is that I know of. We're fixing at least these types of bugs at least once a week. It looks like any other bug fix because it's hard to tell where they come from. Sometimes people, one person did a, um, had a presentation. They said they found, tracked all the bugs that landed in the kernel. And they're like, here's this like 20 patches that we never could find on a mailing list. Where did those come from? Like, ah, well, that's where they came from. Those were security fixes. So now we're learning, and well, sometimes we'll now post them to, to public mailing lists. So it doesn't kind of like be an obvious signal in the noise. Um, because we know people watch our repos. We know what this happens. Um, sometimes we fix things and we don't know if they're actually worth security. Famously, I broke and then fixed three years later a huge security bug for all RHEL servers. Um, I didn't realize it. I didn't realize it was a security bug. Other people looking at this stuff years and years later realize it was a fix. You know, I, if I can't pay, realize that, then nobody can. Um, 
And we all add bugs. The people who add, have the most bugs created are your core contributors because they're doing the most work. We're just human. So you can't look at this. I gave a talk where I said, here's the people that wrote the most bugs, and here's the people that wrote the most patches, and they matched identically. <laughs> so are you going to keep the people that wrote the most patches out of the tree? No. Just the goal is to test and find bugs from everybody. It's not a matter of trust. It's like, don't trust me, I don't trust you, but I'm going to find your bugs and you're going to find my bugs. We're going to test and find everybody's bugs. So no need to figure out who or where these changes are coming from. We don't trust anybody's. Uh, and we don't differentiate between bug types. All right, that was fast. CVEs. CVEs used to mean nothing for Linux. Gave a great talk about this back in 2019. Now that's changed as of February. They now mean something. <laughs> Kernel.org is a CNA. Previously, anybody could create a kernel bug and make a CVE, or cre create a kernel CVE. Famously, Red Hat abused the system. They would create CVEs for any patch that they wanted to add to their distro in an easy way to subvert their internal engineering processes. They've admitted this. So they created a CVE, boom, patch got in, less review, made their engineers' life easier. They were abusing the process. Um, it was impossible to get them revoked. Other things like that. With new laws coming from Europe and other governments, open source projects need to take responsibility for all their known vulnerabilities and disclose them. Because of this, CVE now allows open source projects to be a CNA, a numbering authority. So now, they, did not, they used to not do this. Kernel.org, I'm now responsible for all the vulnerabilities within the Linux kernel, not just me, our team. There's four of us doing this work. So the community is now in control. It's our project. We don't rely on other people. We can revoke them very easily. And we now assign for all vulnerabilities. I put vulnerabilities in quotes for a good reason. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, here's how you contact us. Here's the documentation for how this works. Everything's in public. We discuss these things in public. We review them in public, all in public. Then there's a mailing list for everything that's actually there. You can search it. So. All published CVEs are there. Very simple. This is how we do our stuff. So what about vulnerability? What is a vulnerability? This is the definition of a vulnerability by CVE. So I have to, or we have to, mark every single bug fix that meets this criteria as a CVE vulnerability fix. If I don't, then we, they'll revoke our ability to do this. This is a requirement. That's a very broad statement, isn't it? I don't know your use case. I don't know what part of the code you're using. I don't know how you're using this. So I have to be very, very broad in saying, what is this bug fix? Could it be an issue? So here's the things we've come up with. Um, and this is just a subset. We have a whole bunch of other stuff. So anything user triggerable, obviously, if you crash, crash the machine, denial of service, memory use after, use after free, leak, overflow, boundary checking, denial of service, logic errors, loads and loads of other things. Um, these are all types of vulnerabilities. Not necessarily you're not using them, not doing this type of stuff, using this part of the kernel, but I have to disclose it. One thing that is really interesting, in the kernel, um, developers would do something called warn, like an assert. Warn if this happens. And it'd be like a little warning, tell user this, and spit message out to the log. Well, it turns out there's an option in the kernel called panic on warn. So if you panic, you reboot the machine, or you freeze the machine. Um, billions of devices in the world ship with panic on warn now. All the cloud systems in the world have panic on warn because they want to reboot and you know, recover and keep on going. Um, that's a bad idea. That turns any way that user space or any way you could trigger a warn in the kernel to be a vulnerability. So we assign a lot of CVEs for things that end up being worn. So I answer this all the time. Developers are like, what? It's just a, just a trace back. What's the, what's the big deal? I'm like, well, you rebooted a billion Android devices. Um, Android's slowly moving away from this. Newer versions of Android will not be doing this because they don't want it necessarily reboot. Um, some just want to, some people do want it though. Again, I don't know your use case, so I need to cover those that have a use case. If you don't, have this enabled, don't worry about these type of bugs. That's it. Um, something that's other interesting, what is not a vulnerability? Data corruption, data loss, not a vulnerability. But that's a really big bug, right? You want those bug fixes. CV doesn't care. Performance issues. I could cause your machine to go to a crawl. Still works, 
not vulnerability. Um, or something that's not externally triggered, just a bug fix. All right, other things that you could do but necessarily might not happen all the time. That's not a vulnerability, doesn't get it. So a lot of people are confused about that first one, including myself, remember that. So how do we assign these guys? Um, CV team, there's uh, four of us to do this now. We read every single stable commit that goes in. So that's what, 33 changes a, a day? We revote, yes, no. Uh, after we voted them, we check them all into the Git, run a script, we see who voted for what. Uh, we comment on them if we don't think that somebody, some should be or some shouldn't be. We agree, like we do best two out of three, best three out of four sometimes. And we assign them, and we give them a go. Um, happens in public, watch our Git tree. You wanna see what's gonna come? Just watch it all there. Um, that's how we do this, uh, four of us, and we love help. Anybody wants to help us out, please let us know. Just send me patches. Uh, it's a very standard format for how we do this stuff. One line per change, works out really well. Um, the people all, we, uniquely, we all do it in four different ways. I read everyone through my mail reader. Uh, somebody else uses this awesome regular expression through a tool that catches most of the things. Um, somebody else uses the LLM, and then I don't know what the fourth person uses. <laughs> so um, we all do it differently, and we all find them a different way. It's good. We all, it's not relying on just any one of us, and then we do it that way. So hopefully we catch the majority of them. Sometimes we catch things that we're obviously like, no, fix your scripts, those are wrong. And also we have community requests. If you think a CV should be assigned, just let us know. Um, I have no problem with that. Do about one or two of those. Yeah, about one of those a day. Um, not very often, actually. Um, it's very easy. A lot of people, security researchers, want a CVE for their CV. Fix the bug and you get a CVE. <laughs> Um, I thought when we started we'd do about 40 a week. We're doing 60 a week. Um, that's only 10% of what's in the stable tree though. So stable patches are 10% of those are getting CVEs, 90% are not. Some of the patches for a CVE relied on five patches previous to that though. So we can't tag those five previous patches, we just tag that one. So watch out for that. So you can't cherry pick things. Um, they, we say what files are affected. Nobody ever used to do that before. We say what versions of the kernel are affected. Nobody used to say that before. So because of that, it's very, very easy to automatically filter. We use JSON, everybody can parse this stuff, um, to see if a CVE is applicable to you. You know what kernel files you build into your system, right? Right, I hope so. <laughs> um, you should, this, it's very easy to do. Oh, I have a script out there from a long time ago that'll tell you what files are used to build your kernel image. You can run that against, compare it all those to the CVEs, you throw away 80% of them, they just don't affect you. The rest of them you can look at and see does it match your use case or not, yes, no, and away you go. Um, it's very easy, very few of them are actually applicable to what you run. Um, because, but you know your use cases, you know what files you use, Watch them. I mean, this again, all scriptable. You can pull from the main cve.org git tree and have it run on triggers. People do that and filter. Um, some CVEs are for you. We do fix real issues every week and ignoring them will affect your security. Um, please, please take these. Um, but there's 60 of them a week, there's a lot. Um, but they happen late. It's at least a one to two week delay. Um, we do this on purpose. One, we're busy with other things, we do this on our own time. Um, but we also um, want things to be fixed in the world before everybody notices and tries to exploit them. That being said, we see announcements, I know the US government's really good at saying, putting some CVEs on their must, must, must fix list. Um, but those are like delayed, they just put one on the list this week for 2022. <laughs> CVE, your CVE. So they're putting things really old that are actually not being fixed in the world, which is sad. But um, they also only reference the specific fix. I don't always know what happened before that. Um, and we don't ever test fixes independently. We only test them in the whole stable tree. So if you look at that original thing, like right now, as of today, CVE review, I think I finished 10.3 today. Maybe not, four, five, and six are in the Git tree to review. We need to summarize them. I think we're waiting for our, at least one or two other reviewers. Um, so we're a couple weeks behind. Um, that's on purpose. So they lag. So there is a lag here. It is hard um, to be sooner than this. 
Um, that being said, if you're just a month out, I'd be happy. Android is like two to three months out. I'm still happy. It still works really well. So how do you deal with this? How do you deal with 60 patches a week? Um, you don't. You don't care. All you got to do is take the stable kernels. Just take these releases, please. I'm giving them all to you for free, tested together, the best test by a huge number of different community members, different configurations, different systems. Look at all the people who do all the testing for all the releases, for the stable releases. They have their names on every commit, or on every release commit. I put all the lists of everything that's tested. Um, we test them as a whole. By non bonus, you'll actually get the data corruption fixes. Because <laughs> a lot of those are in there. There's a lot of file system fixes and a lot of core um, I.O. fixes that fix real issues that people have. Um, I, I looked at one today. I was reading it. I was like, OK, well, that was in the RAID subsystem. Yeah, that would corrupt all your data. But it's not a CVE, so I don't tag it as such. But it's in stable kernels. You want those. You want the performance improvements. You want the other stuff like that. So just take the stable kernels. And we have proof this can be done. Thank you. Um, Debian runs over 80% of the world, has been taking stable kernel updates, keeping the world secure. Android, billions of devices out there, takes every stable kernel update on a couple months lag, but they're doing it, and they're keeping their devices secure. There's nothing more complex than an embedded Android system, and there's nothing more common and easy to use than a Debian server system. The two extremes have been doing this for years. There's no reason everybody else can't, right? So we've covered 80% of the servers, covered all the embedded systems for Android devices. So let's cover the last little tiny small subset of, of enterprise districts. Why aren't they doing this? Why can't they do this? Oh, and Android does this, keeping an internal stable kernel ABI. So Android kernels are stable internally due to those 300 drivers outside of them with all the stable updates. So if an enterprise district says we must keep a stable ABI for external drivers, wonderful. It can be done. Android's been doing this for two, three, four years. It can be done. So I think my final slide, quote me on this. That's it. And there's some bonus slides online after this one. But this, it's very simple like that. And is known and secure now. Now you have the proof that the 60 changes a week of CVEs that all, they were always there. We were always fixing these, but nobody was just reporting them. Now we're reporting them, and we have documented proof that if you're not doing this, your system is insecure. So I have three minutes. Questions? Yeah. Uh, thanks. You mentioned uh I'm not required. For a CVE cannot, it, so if a performance decrease does not warrant a vulnerability. Yeah. No. Would that count, would that not count as a denial of service? Denial of service means I stop yeah. you. So if I, if like some of these things, like the card stops taking packets, yes, that is. But if a, oh, I slow things down by 25%, no. What do you mean by 90%? 90, you're still working. I, I, I don't know. We haven't had those issues yet. So. Packets could be dropped. We have, we have some. There's uh, actually a networking fix that just went in last week. We were dropping like one out of every 10 network packets based on this type of, oh, like they finally realized this networking is infinitely configurable, right? This configuration was dropping that. Nobody noticed. Added 10% speed up, right? Not a vulnerability issue. It was just a performance increase, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, next. Um, so you mentioned that you don't know the use cases, so how do you actually do releases and um, testing for releases? What, what kind of integrated tests do you have for release management? Uh, what kind of testing do you do? We rely on you to do testing. So I, re I rely on you to test. So we have a lot of different testing out there. Look at all the people who respond to the release candidates for the stable kernels. Uh, Kernel CI, uh, she was testing. Gunter does some good testing. Lenaro, huge giant test suite. Microsoft, huge giant test suites. Um, Chrome OS team runs through all the Chrome OS tests. Um, people, there's tons and tons of different tests. You test what matters to you. And if it comes back failure, great. Some SOC vendors will report like a couple weeks later to me privately, yes, this worked, or no, this didn't work, um, which is fine. You can do that too. You don't have to have be fast. But it's essential that you let me know soon, because otherwise, if it's months later, I forgot what happened, um, things like that. So it's up to you to test for your use case. That being said, there's a lot of people doing a lot of tests.
It's out there. I think you have a whole talk on this, don't you? What the, yes. Okay, Shua has a whole talk about that. <laughs> so. Okay, um, some companies are saying health support long term kernels much longer. What's your reaction to this? Some companies, yeah, I'll repeat the question. Some companies say they'll report long-term kernels much, much longer. Um, I used to work for one of those companies. Um, <laughs> the money involved in that is, is, is hard to say no to. People somehow think that the lack of change means stability. It does only if the world around you doesn't change. Think of Spectrum Meltdown. The world, your hardware didn't change. The world realized your hardware was broken. Some of the Spectrum Meltdown changes broke, L, broke everybody's vert model, everybody's mathematical model. So they had to go fix them and things like that. So if you're in an enclosed system that never changes, some banks have mainframes in the corner that isn't tied to the outside world, wonderful. Great to support that for forever. Um, otherwise, if you're attached to the world and the world changes, you better keep up to date. Um, that being said, Android is, interacts with the world so hard, and it's crazy. A very, very um, malicious world, and they can handle these stable updates. I don't think, I think it proves that anybody can. Same thing with Debian, things like that. It's just a model of the old model of nothing changes, so it must not be bad. Only take the fix that I want. Well, you want a different fix, and you want a different fix, and you want a different fix. Or isn't it better to fix everything before you realize you needed it? It's just a different mindset. But hey, there's good money in there, so I'm sure somebody will sell it to them. That's good. I'm not in that business anymore. I'm in the business of making secure kernels. I wish them well. It's a hard job. I wouldn't wish. And it's a bastardized kernel. It's horrible. It's thousands upon thousands of patches. It's Linux-like. <laughs> so. Anything else? Last question. I, I think I'll just say I'll repeat it. Yes, it is. It, the question was, many ARM systems using very old version 4 to 6. Remember, a version number is just this point in time. 4 to 6 doesn't mean anything. It's the month, 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 month after that. Um, I'll quote a very, very large industrial company that uses Linux and supports it for 25 years in their devices. They're like, you're buying this big machine from us that runs a, the air conditioning for like hotels. And as part of the life cycle of this, that I'm going to maintain this for 20 years and update the hardware. I'm going to make sure your, your fans are still running. I'm going to update the software for you and make sure that I keep up to date. And then maybe in the last two years, I'll stop updating the kernel and do that. So Linux, I know Linux runs on 32-bit ARM systems and air conditioning systems running the latest kernel. It is possible to do that. Uh, will you abandon some drivers? Will we abandon some drivers? We do abandon drivers all the time. Um, but if you use it, tell us, and we'll bring it back. We can, I can bring it back in a flash. We usually only abandon things when we know that there's problems with it and there's nobody there to do the work, and something like that. Other architectures like ARM32, is, if it's still alive and still being used, yes. PA risk, or we got rid of one machine when we told the last user, please unplug it. <laughs> it finally did, and saved them so much on power. Um, so we will abandon things, but um, we also have things that we know are broken in the kernel because they work really well for that user. I will call out, there's one um, line discipline for, uh, for serial ports that is horrible. It's a horrible security hole, whatever, but on their systems and in their use case, it's very secure and works really well. So we keep it. Although it's like broken by design, but we keep it. There's some network protocols in there that are broken by design, and the specification says there is no security, but we keep it because people use it in some situations. We trust that they will use it in a secure way. Um, we keep this stuff around. So, yeah. If there's a user, we'll keep it. So if it was, just keep it. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah but, uh, but let us know. Tell us. Don't wait four years and say, hey, you deleted something four years ago. Just stay up to date. I mean, update every couple months. See what's going on. So, it's cool. I ran out of time. Um, thank you very much. All the slides are there or they're in the schedule. Thanks a lot. <laughs>